Okay, so this is Tuesday, September 8th, and uh, this is sociology class during our short week. Um, you know, Labor Day was yesterday, so if you're in my Monday, Wednesday, Friday class watching this virtually, this is what we're going to be doing on Wednesday when you come to class. So you don't have to watch this if you're coming to class, um, but if you watch this early, uh, then, you know, that's uh, your Wednesday obligation for, for this week. So um, Thursday and Friday of this week are virtual work days on Project One. Text me with questions. I need to hear from you if anybody has questions. Okay, so... Um, Today, we are going to cover the beginnings of both Chapter 2 and Chapter 3 simultaneously. They go together really, really well. Chapter 1 was kind of like our logistics chapter in sociology. We need all that information from Chapter 1 every single day moving forward. Um, I've talked about course learning outcome number one a lot, which is being able to apply your sociological imagination. So we first learn what that is in chapter one, um, and, and then project one, you know, try to get, tries to get you to apply those sociological perspectives to, um, you know, just casual conversation with your granny or whoever it is you choose to write to. Um, but all that information about the perspectives, information about social facts from chapter one, and information from chapter two and chapter three, all of this builds on your macro level and micro level sociology knowledge so that you can begin to make those connections, informed connections between macro and micro, which is essentially the definition of the sociological imagination. Okay, so um, chapter two is about culture. We're going to define that today and talk about some different components of culture that go along with um, societies everywhere. And chapter three is about socialization. They are linked because the definition of culture includes the fact that none of us are born knowing anything about how to behave in our society. There are some basic animal needs that human beings have, like every other, I, I mentioned before the recording was going on that I have puppies now, you know, there's some basic animal needs. They need food and water and they pee and they poop, you know, there's basic stuff that we're born doing. But there's culture, there's habits and rituals and customs and traditions that overlap that basic stuff that all animals do, and it's different from one place to the next, and we have to learn it. We have to learn the specifics of eating. You know, are foods the same from one place to the next? No. The different kinds of ingredients are different, the way things are cooked are different. So. Food was something I mentioned that all humans need, but the ways in which the cultural ways, the habits, the traditions, the customs that go along with food traditions are very different from place to place. Um, very, very different. I have a friend from Taiwan, which is a tiny little island nation um, in the China Sea off the coast of China, and it's a tiny little island, and so they have tons of seafood that they eat all the time. That makes sense, right? You've got some geography there that guides what um, their menu offerings are going to be. So when she moved here at first, she loved all of the beef that was available at such a cheap, a cheap price because it was really expensive there. Everything's imported. And uh, But now, she's been here for several years, and she's like, you know, now I realize how boring your grocery store is, because all you've got, pretty much, is beef and chicken and pork and some fish and things like that. But anyway, so, um, so yeah, depending upon <clears throat> where you are, your customs and, and rituals and traditions, which are key words in the definition of culture, you have to learn them, and the learning process in sociology, we use this word, socialization. So these two chapters go together. In um, Blackboard, you have already seen that there is a reading assignment for Unit 1, Chapters 1 through 3. Okay, so you should have completed chapter one by now. It's got the basic information in it that'll help you with project one that's open right now. And now you should be fully into chapters two and three. Okay, so this week, even though it's a short week, and next week, we should, I think, don't hold me to it, but we should be finishing up chapter two and three together between now and next week. Okay? Um, so, 
let's get some key words in a good that every good definition of culture must have in it in order for you to earn maximum points, right? And in order for you to be um, inclusive about what that word means. So I've rattled off a few things already that go in the definition. Things like customs. What other words, I should have asked you what I rattled off in case any of y'all remember. What other words do you remember that I have mentioned while we were briefly talking about culture? Customs, rituals, traditions. Language. Language is a big one. I don't think I mentioned that one yet, but language is a big marker of culture. So language should go in there. Yeah. Values. Excellent. Good. Yes, you're, the values that a society holds as true or as dear. Correct. So customs, rituals, traditions, language, also material objects and knowledge about how to use those material objects. So these are kind of like, think of these as like the components of culture. But a good definition of culture is not just going to stop with a list of components that make up culture. You also have to say that culture is shared by the population. So a population of people, I'm going to abbreviate population with just pop, okay? So a population of people shares all of the knowledge, shares language, shares values, traditions, habits, rituals, all of the components that we have in the list. It's not a culture if just one person on the world in the world observes that. Culture is shared among people in the population. And the link, um, the population shared, no, shares. Okay. <laughs> See if my, if my verb agreement is there, since this is on YouTube, I'm not sure. I'm not the best grammarian in the world. Okay, so the population shares that all of these things, but also, and here's the major link of a that has to be included in a good definition of culture, here's the major link between culture itself and the topic of the next chapter, which is socialization. The population shares it, but it's passed from one generation to the next. This is a kind of, this is a key thing. These last two things are key things. These are the components of culture, and that's not even a comprehensive list. I'm sure I've left off something that maybe your textbook author includes. But these, think of these as the components of culture. These things uh, over here are called non-material culture. This one is called material culture. Physical objects, tangible things are called material culture. Because you can touch it, this marker, my mask that I grabbed really quick because I moved a little close to Jewel over here. <laughs> so these are material objects that we have knowledge about how to use in our society. These are non-material. You can't touch a tradition. There are probably material objects associated with traditions. Such as Thanksgiving, can you think of a material object, something you can touch that's associated with the holiday, the USA holiday Thanksgiving? A turkey, right? Why didn't she say hot dogs? 
that's the 4th of July, Miss T. Right? That was Labor Day if, if we had a, you know, a celebration on Labor Day, right? All these Estado and Edense holidays that I'm going to use examples of. Okay? So, um, material objects, in other words, can be linked to traditions, can be linked to rituals, can be linked to customs, etc. all of those different kinds of things. Again, my friend Anne, or at least that's her English name, uh, my friend Anne from Taiwan, uh, uses chopsticks for everything. That woman can pick up a teeny tiny little grain of rice, just one of them, with chopsticks because she has learned, she's learned, passed from one generation to the next, she's learned since she was a baby um, how to use chopsticks. There is an Asian market that I love to go to called Mr. Chen's over here on University close to UALR. And they have little baby, little baby chopsticks like that you, you know, you give, I don't know, how old is a, is a USA baby when you give them a spoon for the first time to try to hold or something. I don't know. You give chopsticks to those little, little babies in Taiwan. That's what their mamas and daddies give them. So she knows, she has knowledge about how to use those material objects that, I mean, I can get something to my mouth with chopsticks, but sometimes as I'm doing it, it phew, shoots across the room, right? Because I'm not very good at it. You know, I, haven't, I wasn't born with them in my hand, so to speak. If I had learned it, if the generation before me had taught me how to use it, I'd be much better at using chopsticks. Okay? So... These are components of culture, material culture, non-material culture. That's talking about tangible versus non-tangible um, items of culture. Tangible is a good word, just a good college level word for you to have. It, tangible means something you can touch. Non-tangible or intangible means something you cannot touch. It's a concept. Okay? Like I think I asked y'all about the color red the other day, and what did it symbolize? Was that this class? Yeah. And um, I was waiting for somebody to say, love is what red symbolizes. I think I got, did I get, I got love from this. Yes. Yes, I got some love from y'all. But um, my other classes was like anger and stop and hot, and I'm like, give me some love from the color red, right? Or passion or something, right? These concepts that we associate with the color red are specific to our culture, our society, okay? So the, the values, oh, I see that I didn't put, a, put an S on that word. Values, traditions, customs, language. Language is a huge part of culture, huge part of culture. Um, it identifies us as a cultural group in a lot of cases. Even the accent, can you tell in general, if you are an English speaker from the United States English speaker, can you kind of tell when somebody's not from your area even? They're speaking English and the communication process is going on, but you can kind of tell. Um, over the weekend, we had a friend from Wisconsin need to stay with us um, as he's traveling across the, the country from a job that he did um, out, you know, out west. And he's from Wisconsin. I can't, I can't do accents. I wish I could. But he's got like really round, round vowels kind of when he's, when he's speaking. He's speaking English. We understand him perfectly. But the accent's a little different. I can't do it. I can't. Wish I could do accents. But anyway, so even the accent can identify you as not being from here, not being from these parts, kind of. Okay, and that's in any language. Of course, I'm using English as an example, but that's in any language. If you're from France and you speak French, you can tell if somebody is from, you know, the northern part of, of France or if somebody's from, you know, down on the Riviera, like Marseille or something. There's a different kind of accent. Okay, so we will go deeper into Chapter 2 here in just a little while, but because of this particular statement that culture is passed from one generation to the next, I want to also introduce the basic idea of chapter three. These two chapters go together really well. And they are some really foundational knowledge, uh, like chapter one was. Uh, they're really some foundational knowledge for you to keep in mind as we are learning more specific things in future chapters. Okay? <clears throat> so... 
the word socialization here, this is one of those situations where I'm going to ask you to give yourself a reminder in the margin of your notes that even though you hear this word often in everyday speech, in sociology it has a different definition. Okay? So you're going to have to intentionally make yourself learn this definition. I'm going to give you key words like I usually do so that you can write your own sentence or sentences to explain it. But please make sure that you remind yourself some kind of way in your notes that this does not mean visiting and chatting and hanging out. I hear, I hear people talk about um, socializing. Well, I, I told y'all I'll talk about my puppies again. We got puppies recently, and when I took them to the vet for the first time, one of them's a pretty big dog, and so the vet was talking about how I needed to socialize this dog a lot so he wouldn't be aggressive or, you know, scare people or something. He'd be friendly. And what she meant was I needed him to have a lot of interactions, different kinds of interactions, for this dog to experience so he wouldn't get scared and, you know, be a danger to somebody. So even the veterinarian that I took my puppies to was talking about socializing my dogs, giving them lots of experiences. It's not quite what we mean when we say socialization in sociology class. This socialization is the learning process that happens in our culture when generations before us or our peer groups or TV and movies and social networks that we interact with, school that we interact with, when we learn our culture from one generation to the next. So socialization is a learning process. That's the key starting point in a good definition of socialization. It's a learning process. And so now, what do we learn? Well, we learn our culture. We learn how to be in our social group. What is it that we're learning? Well, what are the rules that we're supposed to follow to be in our social group? We're not born knowing those. We have to pick those up as we go along. We have to learn how to be in our social group. We have to learn language. We have to learn how to communicate with each other. We even have to learn how to keep hold ourselves physically. We have to learn body language. We have to learn like tone of voice and all sorts of things that overlap our language that also communicate. So it's physical conditions. We have to learn appropriate ways of thinking. Remember with, um, with the term social facts that we talked about in a recent lecture, social facts are patterned ways of thinking, feeling, and acting that exist in a society. Those patterns come from the culture that we live in. Those patterns come from here. So in the socialization process, we learn how to be a member of our, of our social group, of our society. We learn the patterned ways of thinking, feeling, and acting. We learn those things. The conditions, physical conditions, mental conditions, beliefs, we learn those things. Okay, so it's a learning process. You learn how to be in your social group. Here's a question for you. How long would it take you? Well, let me see. I'm, I'm asking this a little more complicated than it needs to be. How long do you think the learning process takes? Ten years. Ten I've got a ten years. So, anybody else? Oh, you would say that it's lifelong. Okay, so we've got 10 years, we've got lifelong. All right, anybody else? We're, I see some head nods. Okay, let's talk about the 10 years one. So, um, at one years old, one year old, there are certain behaviors that a, a child is expected to do. Two years old. Again, you've added more behaviors that a child is expected to do. Three years old, more behaviors still, right? four, five, six, all the way up through 10 years old. At 10 years old, does a 10-year-old know what's expected of an adult? So a 10-year-old is not yet ready to be an adult, not the way we 
pass our culture from one generation to the next. In other cultures, some cultures, like we talked about arranged marriage in this, in this class the other day as a patterned way of thinking, feeling, and acting that exists in some cultures but not ours. Um, in some cultures, uh, by the time you're 12 or 13, we would call a 12 or 13 year old a child, right? Or it, a tween, is that a word that y'all still use today, right? So, so we have like even different sectors of childhood where there's different expectations of behavior and how to be in your social group based on your age. So in other cultures though, if you are expected to be married at 12 or 13 years old, there's a different set of information that has to be passed to you more quickly. But still at 12 or 13, if you're married at 12 or 13, is it the same as a marriage at 23 or 33 or 43? No. So the, the lifelong answer is the correct answer because you're constantly changing in age yourself and society's patterned ways of thinking, feeling, and acting change based on your age. When you're five, if you like to do certain things when you're five, certain things when you're 15, when you're 25, 35, etc., are still okay. Like my husband's favorite thing when he was five was fishing and hunting. Favorite thing. Guess what his favorite thing still is now at 65? Fishing and hunting. And that's perfectly okay, right? Other things are not perfectly okay. Uh, that you would accept from a five-year-old. You would be less tolerant of them with a 15-year-old. You sure don't want them to be part of a 25-year-old. And it's not just you when I use that pronoun. It's not you want them. It's society's pattern way of thinking, feeling, and acting, what an average 25-year-old is expected to be, what an average 55-year-old is expected to be, right? So these things change over time. So this learning process is lifelong because the expectations that society has for us, for our social behavior, is constantly changing. So we have to constantly adjust. We have to constantly learn how to fit our role, how to fit the status that we occupy in a society. So this learning process is lifelong. We learn how to be in our social group, conditions for how we're supposed to be, beliefs, how we're supposed to be, attitudes, how we're supposed to, behaviors, how we're supposed to act. We learn all of those things specific to our social group. How do we learn them? I've kind of said it already, but not concisely. How does this learning process, we know that the learning process takes a lifetime, birth to death, but how? Through experiences, yes. I like the tone of voice you used with that. It's through experience, duh. <laughs> Yes, it's through experience. It's not through sit down class, open your notebook, and take notes. This is how you blow your nose. Step one, you feel something running. Step two, don't touch it. Go get a Kleenex. Step three, this is what a Kleenex is as opposed to your shirt. Step four, right? We don't sit you down and give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to blow your nose. Any of y'all ever tried to teach a little kid how to blow their nose before? Oh, my goodness. They don't catch on too quickly, right? So do what? I know in that cue, you're like, blow, and that with their mouth, they go, because they've heard you kind of make that noise. Yeah, so it's a lifelong thing. How do you learn? You learn through experience. You learn through interaction. We have a very complex ritual in our society for the appropriate way to blow your nose and dispose of it. Really complex. If it wasn't complex, it would be quick for that little one to, to um, catch on to. It's really complex. It's, you learn through experience. You learn through interaction. You learn through interaction with everyone around you not just people in the older generation. We pass culture from one generation to the next, 
but you're not simply and only learning from me, your older generation, or your mama, your older generation. You're learning from those around you who you interact with at school, people in your age cohort, people in your peer group. You learn from TV. You learn from video games. There's a rating system on video games and TV and movies. That rating system is supposed to be a guide for parents so they make sure that you don't experience certain things at a certain age that they might not want you to experience yet or at all in some cases. So these we learn through experience. It doesn't have to be interaction with another person face to face. It can be interaction with another person through YouTube. It can be interaction with another person on Mixer. It can be anything, right? So chapter two and chapter three go together intimately because chapter two explains what culture is in general. Um, culture is different from one place to the next. Not, you know, just think about, just use language as an example. One country to another country to another country, it's not a newsflash for me to tell you that different languages are spoken from one country to the next. Right? Some countries, like the United States and England, the United States and South Africa, the United States and the Bahamas, the United States and Belize, some countries, you know, parts of Canada, speak English, but not even all the same words are the same. Um, values. This country, we will talk about often, about how the United States was founded as a Christian country. Have you heard that before in, in your history classes? It was founded by Europeans who brought Christianity here, right? So the uh, rules of government and the, the customs that we have, these kinds of things, the traditions that we have, generally have kind of like a Christian flavor to them at least, okay? So our values are typically based on Christian values. There are other religions in the world like Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, all sorts of other religions in the world that have a different set of values, traditions, rituals, holidays, belief systems, and therefore the values are different based on um, the different uh, belief systems that exist. So culture is different from one place to the next. It, in a country the size of the United States with the diversity of the United States, like I said, you can tell accents are different from one place to the next. Um, customs and traditions, rituals are different from one place to the next also. Even within a nation where we say we have a United States culture, well, is Southern different than Northern as far as culture goes? See a lot of heads shaking. Is East Coast different than West Coast as far as culture goes? Is Chicago different than Honolulu as far as culture goes? I've never been to Honolulu, but I see it on TV and it looks different to me, right? So um, culture is different from one place to the next, and it's, but it's still passed through from one generation to the next. It still has to be shared by everybody who lives in the general vicinity. And so this socialization process, no matter how different a culture is from one place to the next, Socialization is the way that members of that population learn it. Okay? Questions? While I'm erasing this with my back to the board, please speak up if you have any questions. And remember, I'm erasing this. Let me stop for a second before I erase this one. Remember, this kind of bullet point list, these, these lists that I make, are key words, key concepts that have to go into a good definition of these words um, if I ask you to write one, okay? It, it would be good practice for you during your reaction papers when you're supposed to be reviewing concepts from class. It would be really good practice for you to go back and without looking in your textbook, Try to write a good sentence or two definition, as short as you can make it, but with all those parts in it, um, of culture, of socialization. And then double check yourself with the, um, 
with the textbook author's definition. You know, I think they're what, in, like in a yellow box or something. Are they in yellow boxes at the bottom of the page? Something like that. Um, so double check yourself with the, the way your textbook author writes the definition. And if we've left out something, like tell me, text me about it so I can send an announcement on Blackboard that, I, hey, I left something out of the video, right? Um, double check me. Did we make sure and, and put everything? Did I give you the skeleton of what you needed in order to write that definition correctly? Okay? So, like, it has to have all these things. And I think your textbook author lists, like, specific things like a condition or a behavior or a belief specific to your social group. I believe that there's extra, extra keywords that your textbook author gives you. Self-identity, I left that one off. Yes, self-identity. So how to be in our social group, it would be self-identity, it would be behaviors, beliefs, conditions. Yes. What page is that on, please? 67. Wow, we're a long way into the book, aren't we? Yeah, <laughs> 67. Thank you. Okay, so that's why we need the book and our notes and, and video lectures. So let's talk about a concept that we will learn primarily from chapter two. So I know we're switching back and forth from chapter two and three, but let's go deeper into culture because there are some key words that I have already used in class and I think we haven't defined. And uh, there's going to be some key concepts that you're going to need to take with you uh, from the culture chapter. And that is um, the word norms. Norm. Now, this is a root word of a word that we use all the time, normal, uh, with all of our social distancing that we're doing and face masks and all this kind of stuff. We are talking a whole lot about normal life these days, aren't we? When are we going to get back to normal life or is there going to be a new normal, right? We're using that word a whole lot. Well, in sociology, we look at the root word, norms, and essentially, norms are rules about social behavior. Okay, there's a really short, concise definition. It's not complete, really, that short, concise definition. But norms are rules about behavior. They're rules about patterned ways of thinking, feeling, and acting in our society. Rules about behavior, it's about attitudes, it's about conditions for living, it's rules about that. I always draw a picture, it's more like a graph I guess, that goes along with norms, um, that's just kind of this line. and. Norms have other key words in them that I find it helps, it's easier to remember if you've got like a picture to go with it. Rules go both ways. Sometimes there's rules about what you can do, but also there's rules about what you can't do, right? So there's an arrow going that way, and there's an arrow going that way because norms go both ways. There's rules about <clears throat> what is acceptable to do, But there's also rules about what's not allowed, what's unacceptable. So there's social rules about behavior, attitudes, conditions that we're supposed to be, but also what we're not supposed to be. So some things are perfectly acceptable, other things are, unaccept are perfectly unacceptable, right? But there's always this kind of like gray area too. Why? Why do I say there's like a gray area? Okay, it could be depending upon the situation. That's, that's one reason why there is um, a gray area because if there's a behavior that's in here, under more, most circumstances it's acceptable, but sometimes you would not do that based on the situation. That's a good reason why we would have a gray area. What else? Maybe it's not appropriate for your age group. You're seven years old right now. You can't do that. But when you're 17, yes. 
So absolutely, as we change over time, the social expectation of our behavior is going to change over time. Anything else? It could be level of understanding. I kind of see that as like the same thing depending upon what, what your age is. What I'm trying to, to get from you is that not every culture includes every human behavior that's possible. I didn't say that well. Let me, let me give an example for what I mean. Um, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do it, but when I teach anthropology class, I bring in a big Ziploc bag of, you know, not that I made, but that a food vendor made, of sour cream and onion crickets and mealworms for everybody to try if they want them. <laughs> like, so Lainey's eyebrows kind of go, what? Yes, I said sour cream and onion, so far so good. Crickets and mealworms. Anybody? No? <laughs> no, you wouldn't try it. Don't worry. Sociology students are not asked to venture out into that kind of cuisine. But let me just say to you, crickets, mealworms, grasshoppers, lots of things that you and I get bug spray or stomp on to get rid of, those things are perfectly edible. They're perfectly nutritious for the human body, for lots of different kinds of animals, humans included. They're perfectly edible, but the reason you wrinkled your eyebrows like that, the reason you were like, uh-uh, is because it's not part of our non-material culture. We don't have a grasp of edible. When we see something, we stomp on it or spray it or swat at it or something like that. That's how we deal with bugs in our culture, we don't make a taco out of it. We don't make chocolate chip cookies out of it. Well, I do, but most people don't. You can go on Amazon. I don't know how much it costs. Somebody can look it up for me right now if you don't believe me. But you can go on Amazon and get cricket flour. It's a little bit expensive to find it when it's on sale. But um, I made chocolate chip cookies for my anthropology class also. After we had eaten the sour cream and onion crickets, I was like, oh, I made chocolate chip cookies. And my students were like, oh, what's in it? <laughs> right? Well, anybody want to taste it and find out? And they couldn't. I mean, it tastes like a chocolate chip cookie. But that's odd for y'all, and y'all are thinking, woo, I'm glad I didn't take anthropology class from this woman. Because that's a behavior that's perfectly acceptable some places, but not here. And I wonder, I wonder, would it be acceptable here? If it was taught, of course, yes, that's the correct answer. But like, I wonder if, like right now, Kroger started introducing candied grasshoppers. Would be When we had meat shortages, vegetarians did not care. You're absolutely right. But, you know, also, do, are, are people, do we hear about people in poverty who go hungry all the time? Yeah. And so to think that we have huge populations of creatures on the planet, bugs I'm talking about, not all of which we can eat. Some bugs are poisonous or venomous to us. But... We have this huge population of bugs on the planet, most of which are edible to human beings, but we don't define them as food. It's not part of our cultural concept. So even though there's plenty of food to go around, you and I don't define that group of creatures as food, and so we don't consume it. And there's lots of other things that are cl more closely related to the stuff that we define as food that we wouldn't eat either. Like, what about horse meat or donkey meat? You're saying no to that? Horse meat and donkey meat are eaten very commonly around the world, but not really here widely yet. A few years ago, there was a push um, in, in Arkansas to start being able to sell horse meat, not donkey meat, I don't think. I think it was just limited to horse meat um, in grocery stores, like have a meat inspector inspect it, like the beef and the, the chicken and the pork that you can buy, the lamb that you can buy in the grocery store, um, and, and sell it openly. It didn't go through the people in the legislature who were voting on funding that position to have a meat inspector did not fund 
the position to have a meat inspector. So instead, the horse meat either has to go to the dog food factory or is just incinerated. Incinerated. I think cat food factories also. Um, but there's a whole lot of meat. There's a whole lot of meat that's available, but we don't have it. We didn't learn that growing up. And for some reason, we learned that there's a big difference between a cow and a horse. And behavior-wise, yes. Behavior-wise, yes, there's a great big old difference between a cow and a horse. And some people say, well, a horse is my pet, and a horse is how the West was won. And a horse drives the cattle from point A to point B, and a horse is a tool that can help us plow our field, or something like that, is usually the... Um, is usually the argument, and that's a great argument, but a horse also has a heck of a lot of meat on that critter. Heck of a lot of meat. Yes, ma'am. Right, can we incorporate culture points? Like, over there in, what, India, they believe milking cows because of the religious aspect. Excellent example. In India, where Hinduism is one of the, it is the most dominant religion, in Hinduism, there is a prohibition, like a commandment against eating beef. Absolutely. So you can look at it that way. That's a great example of how we learn from one generation to the next, and customs, rituals, traditions, beliefs are different from one place to the next based on religious foundations. One of my last vlogs, he is from Pakistan, uh -huh. and he can only eat from a certain store because his friend owns it, and it has to be blessed. Yes. So, okay. So, so a friend of yours or an associate of yours from Pakistan has to eat meat from only a certain store. I, I know what you're talking about. There are two or three stores in Little Rock that do it that way, but the even meat must be butchered in a certain way uh, in order for some people who practice certain religions, in this case, it would be Islam in this case, um, you have to butcher meat in, in a way that's called halal meat. Um, and you have to drain blood properly and cut it properly in order for it to follow the Islamic law. That's a great example. In Judaism, also, there are really strict rules on what you can and can't eat. You can look at the Old Testament, which is part of Jewish tradition. In Leviticus, I believe, opens with rules about what you can eat. These you can eat. It's, uh, it talks about locusts, and it talks about all kinds of other you know, animals that you can eat. Uh, and these you can't eat. And it talks about dog, not being able to eat dog, not being able to eat pig, not being able to do those kinds of things. And they have some uh, religious food tradition called kosher preparation, where you can't, where dairy and meat can't come together, like are not supposed to come together. You can't even store it in the same refrigerator, for instance, or cook it in the same pot and that kind of thing. So um, those are some really good examples about how we got a little bit off on a tangent there because I, I love it when I've got foodie people in class with me because I'm a foodie. Um, so anyway, uh, this gray area is because not every behavior that is possible in the scope of human behavior is in every culture. We have to try this behavior first to know whether it would be acceptable or unacceptable. Um, and if you think about upbringing of a child and the nose blowing example, right? Um, there's lots of different ways to deal with snot, right? People love their sleeve until we teach them the complex ritual that's acceptable. Hair works, right? Just blowing it freely works. <laughs> Sorry to shudder with grossness this early in the morning. But uh, we have a complex ritual that we have to teach and kids try the sleeve, and what do we say? No, don't do that. That's dirty or whatever, right? So they try this, and they, then they know. Is it acceptable or is it unacceptable based on something that we get called a sanction, another key word from chapter, um, chapter 2. A sanction is a response um, to a behavior. This is a very, very, very brief definition of what a sanction is. It's a response to a behavior. You can respond in a favorable way, or you can respond in an unfavorable way. So when you're reading about this in Chapter 2, you'll see there's positive sanctions. That's a favorable response. And there's negative sanctions. That's an unfavorable response. What would a positive response encourage you to do? 
do it again or at least teach you that it is on the acceptable side of the norm spectrum, right? So yes, do it again or it's okay to do moving forward. A negative sanction, what would that tell you? The opposite. That's off limits. It's off limits permanently, or that was an unpleasant response I got, so I better not do that again, right? So sanctions happen um, in response to behavior. This is part of that interaction that, and, and life experience that is, we were talking about when we learned the word socialization. How do we learn? We learn through interaction. We learn through life experience. And life experience is full of trying out a behavior and getting a response from people, right? And that response can communicate a world of messages that it's okay to do that behavior so you can repeat it if you want to and nothing negative will happen. Or it's really okay to do that behavior. I will be rewarded greatly for this kind of thing. Or I will be punished terribly and no, I should not do it again. And it happens at all age groups. I'm, I'm kind of stuck on the little kids right now. Um, but it happens at all age groups. So for instance, I know none of you have gotten a speeding ticket ever before. But that speeding ticket is a positive sanction or a negative sanction? It's a negative sanction. It's designed to hurt you a little bit. I don't know how much speeding tickets are these days, but last time I got one, it was at least 100 bucks. last time I got one. Um, so that hurts. It's designed to make you think twice and only do this type of behavior, not this type of behavior. And they come at all ages, right, all, all age groups. Okay, so there's different kinds of norms and different kinds of sanctions. And the different kinds of norms basically are, they focus on not so important norms or serious, very important norms for a society, for the social facts, the pattern way of thinking, feeling, and acting that's required in a, in a, in a society. So here's the three types of norms. Um, the sanctions and norms, these two words you should always think of together. There's always sanctions that go with norms. My sanction might be no response at all. For instance, if, you're, if we eat together and you're eating your french fries and you're picking them up with your fingers and eating them, you'll probably get no response from me whatsoever as a sanction. Why? Why? Is it okay to eat french fries with your fingers? That's why, it's, it's okay. It's widely acceptable. It's fine to eat tater tots and french fries with your fingers just fine. But if we're eating together and we have mashed potatoes and you're eating your mashed potatoes with your fingers, do you think you'll get a sanction from me? What, what might I say? Yeah, where's your fork, honey? Don't eat with your fingers. Didn't your mama teach you, you know, whatever, something. Silly, is it going to be, is the world going to fall in on your head? No, because frankly, if we all started eating our mashed potatoes with our fingers, our society would not change so much. Would not change so much. But if we all started having to have our meat prepared halal style or having to do kosher practices in our household or not eating beef because of a religious practice, then that's a serious thing that would change, right? Okay, so sanctions and norms, they range from not so serious to extremely serious in society. And here's how they, here's how they match up. So there's three types of norms. The first type is not really a serious type at all. It's called folkways. Singular, a folkway. It's a habit, it's a custom, it's just an everyday behavior. Folkways are rules, <clears throat> excuse me, rules about everyday behavior. Like the french fry mashed potato thing. Like the blow in your nose thing. Like speeding or not speeding. It's a folkway. So those things are not so serious, folkways. 
Um, and the sanctions that go with them are not going to be so serious either. Um, you go without dessert. You have to go in timeout. You have a SWAT on your backside, or you get a ticket for $25 for jaywalking or something like this. Oh, that's a thing. You don't want to jay you know, you know what jaywalking is? Like crossing, I'm not sure if I know the technical definition. You're crossing the street where you're not supposed to, you know, there's not a crosswalk. I think any kind of way. I think if you just wander into the street and then back up, that's jaywalking, I think. But anyway, don't do it in the River Market District. <clears throat> 25 bucks. Yeah. So, but you wouldn't expect it to be 525 bucks, right? Because that sanction for that behavior, that's out of balance, kind of, Right? Okay, so folkways are just rules about everyday behavior. Are you supposed to hold the door open for somebody as they're coming in behind you? Are you supposed to start chatting about intimate details of your life when you're on a, an elevator with somebody, right? Your, your simple answers to these questions are your knowledge that you've learned over time about the folkways that exist in this society, okay? Now, so, so these, let me see, I didn't write it on the board, but you'll need it in your notes. These are not so serious behaviors. <clears throat> when I say serious, I mean like society would not change significantly if we modified folkways. Society's not going to change significantly. However, this next type, mores, two syllables, if you'll see it, it's spelled like the word more. But it's mores, is how you say it. These are rules about behavior that a society takes seriously. I'll say morally important. Morally, ethically, yes, those words apply here, yes. Mores. The, the root word for moral or morality is uh, mores, mores. Okay? So rules that a society sees as ethically important, morally important, it's kind of at the foundation of the value system in a society. Elder care, elder abuse. We're supposed to take care of our elders. That might be a folk way that we follow. But if we find out that somebody is abusing our elders who are helpless, this is a serious thing that goes against what we believe in as far as human rights, as far as uh, human kindness, right? Dog fighting, dog fighting, cock fighting these kinds of things where we pit animals against each other to the death. Some people don't like bullfighting in this culture. These uh, we see as morally important. Being faithful in a marriage, do we see that as morally important? We also extend that to people who are merely dating. They're not even in a marriage yet. Do we see that we want, we have a rule that is exclusivity of dating another person, not just in marriage, right? These kinds of rules we see as very, very important in our society. Any other examples you can think of? Okay, uh, the third one, before I give you another example, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you a behavior in just a second and ask you um, if it's a folkway way more or, or laws that apply. Laws is the last one. Okay, so we use this word laws in um, sociology class, and yes, it means things that apply to the criminal justice system, but technically the definition is broader than that in sociology. It's anything that's written down, any social rule that's written down, okay? So... The, so laws can range from not very important for society's fabric to extremely vital for society. So this is not very serious, this is very serious, and this can range from one side of the spectrum to the next. If you 
go to a public swimming pool that has a sign on the fence that says rules, no bubble gum, and no glass containers, no running. Technically, according to a sociology definition, those are laws. And yes, every law in the law library at the UALR Bowen School for Law is also a law, according to this definition. If it's written down, it's a law. And the sanctions will also be written down. So a minute ago we said jaywalking, that's a law. It's a law that has really minor situation as far as changing society significantly. It's a minor law. So the sanction, we wouldn't expect it to be a $500 ticket. If we got a ticket at all, we would expect it to be a warning or $25 max. Right, something that doesn't hurt too bad because it wasn't a significant thing in society to begin with. Driving while under the influence. Is this a law? There are laws that go with it. There are sanctions that are written down. Because we see that as a significant thing in society, you could wreak havoc. You could cause major damage not only to yourself, but to innocent people who weren't doing anything wrong. So this is a serious thing, and the sanctions are going to be a bigger deal. It's not going to be a $25 ticket. Is that going to make you think twice before you do it the next time? No. So you have to have a more serious thing. So norms, these are the types of norms. Sanctions always go with norms. And the severity or the seriousness, the strictness of the sanction um, goes along with how serious or not so serious the, the type of norm is, okay? So I'm going to say, don't eat your mashed potatoes with your fingers. Don't you know any better? And that, there's your sanction, but you, don't, you have no ticket and you have no lasting um, thing that follows you the rest of your life, right? Okay, let me give you um, an example of a behavior and the first thing I want you to tell me in our last minute or two that we have in class today, is this behavior on the acceptable side? Is it the unacceptable side? Is it in the gray area for any kind of reason? Uh, being a stripper. That's the behavior. You're a stripper. Socially, you say it's unacceptable? No. Really? Because I think strip clubs are full every time they're open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, is it on the unacceptable side? You think it's on the acceptable side? Uh, broadly, broadly, like across the board? I think it's in the gray area. You think it's in the gray area? Why? I think, I mean, because it, like, it's done all over. It's done all over. I mean, and, it, and it could still be like something. But it would be unacceptable, probably more of a, from a moral point of view, I guess, like from... Okay, so you're, do, you're stringing toward the second part of this question. So if we decide, so, so I get the feeling from the body language that I got in class that stripping is something that y'all put here because it depends upon the situation, and that's what we said, one of the reasons why there's kind of like a gray area. You said acceptable because it's everywhere, but does everybody accept it? Do they have to? Somebody, did you start out by saying it was unacceptable because it's not? It, is it unacceptable in your mind because if you are a stripper whose third grader has career day, parent career day at their school, are you going to go and say what your career is to all of the... Well, they I'm, might have one hustle one because I know this one girl, she's a Right, they might have another, right, because that's another thing. And that might be another reason why it's in the gray area, because is stripping necessarily a lifelong career? For some. For, <laughs> for some, right, okay. So it's in the gray area probably because it depends on the situation. It might depend on the age also. Um, but you were talking about how it is, Start over again. You were talking about something having to do with this. With, with the more, because people were looking at it like, well, she wasn't raised like this, so it's like 
maybe it would be the parents of the community. That would so we might look at it as morally important, like from a modesty or from a chastity or virgin kind of perspective. Do we, so, so is that what you're, I mean, that's, that's what you're leaning toward? That would be the only thing that I would see. Or, I mean, if you look at it on so many different scales, is that, that, that's what I would only see that, you know, people would see what's wrong with it because it, it's uncomfortable to some. Okay, so it's uncomfortable to some. Some people might judge it harshly. And maybe that's why if your third grader has career day at school and mommy and daddy are supposed to go, mommy and daddy are, might go, but instead of saying... I'm this, they might say, well, I'm a private contractor or something, right? I work for myself. I'm a sole proprietor or something, right? So, okay. Um, yeah, so you see that there's gray areas to this. There's gray areas to this. And some of us will say immediately, that is unacceptable because in our socialization process, ain't no room for that, right? Some of us say it's acceptable because, hey, I make good money and this is getting me through nursing school or whatever the example is that you're having. And while I can do it, I, while I've got it, I'm going to flaunt it. And if somebody wants to pay me for it, I'll take it, honey. I mean, not me, okay? Don't. <laughs> no, that's not included in tuition, okay? So, uh, but uh, in other words, we've got like sectors of society right, which will accept or not accept that. And so I think, I think you're right to say that it's in the gray area because it kind of depends. Um, and I think you're right to say that it's this type of, of norm. The sanction that you'll get, like what might be a sanction if on career day in the third grade you went and you told the third graders, I'm a stripper and this is what I do and this is how I work and these are the hours that I work. And yeah, you're not allowed to come back Right, so so maybe you're not invited back to the next career day, but do you think that your kid would experience sanctions too? Yeah, yeah your kid might experience sanctions because if you send out a slumber party invitations for your ch for your child, you think many of the parents who got an earful about what you do for a living are going to send their kids to your house? Maybe not. Maybe they're going to be judgmental that way, and maybe not. And so there's. Sanctions, I use this as an example for a couple of reasons. Because it's in the gray area, and also the sanction is not something that's written down necessarily, but it can be a serious social sanction where you're not accepted in your general social group. Right? Okay, so hopefully you've got a lot to write about this week for a reaction paper. Your quiz and your reaction paper for week three, as usual, quizzes, uh, reaction papers are due Saturday at noon. I will probably open the reaction paper link sometime today, definitely by tomorrow. I'll open the reaction paper link. You can, if you know that you're busy Saturday at noon, do it Thursday sometime if that's your day off right? So make sure that you budget your time, so to speak, so that you have plenty of time in the window that that reaction paper link is open for you to submit it. And then the quiz is going to be, is going to cover the stuff that we did in our last lesson last week, um, which I have to go back and make sure I know what that is. What were, what were your notes before we started today? Yes, thank you. We went over the Industrial Revolution, social facts before the Industrial Revolution, social facts after the Industrial Revolution. Thank you for the reminder. Um, I took that vacation seriously and went sociology brain dead for just a little while. Um, so anyway, the quiz. So reaction papers, you can choose anything from that Industrial Revolution day that we had in class or anything from this. Um, to teach yourself these concepts. And then the quiz, which will be due on Sunday at noon. Um, I'll open it sometime probably tomorrow afternoon probably. Um, it'll cover that Industrial Revolution lecture and then also this one. Okay? So um, Thursday for y'all, in, in this case, since this is a Tuesday-Thursday class I'm talking to you right now, Thursday is virtual day for you unless you text me and let me hear from you that you want me to come and meet you to help out with Project 1. Okay? So, um... I look forward to hearing from you, and I'll see you soon. Bye.